Thank you very much for the invitation and this uh, wonderful, uh, successful uh, meeting. Uh, uh, thanks for Dr. Kadura for this uh, wonderfully uh, sketched uh, program. Uh, I know everybody is tired, so I'm going to go quick uh, with um, my case. And this is a 35-year-old female with a history of degenerative mitral valve disease, uh, uh, myxomatous valve disease, status post with significant MR, status post failed uh, previous mitral valve repair uh, in 2009. She uh, underwent uh, a mitral valve uh, replacement with bioprosthetic uh, uh, tissue valve in 2002. This is her baseline uh, uh, valvular function, as we can see, nice uh, slim uh, layers of the um, uh, prosthetic, bioprosthetic uh, mitral uh, valve uh, <clears throat> with no regurgitation, no uh, stenosis. And uh, this is the hair LV postoperatively, like, you know, uh, nicely preserved, some septal post-operative changes, but still like within 45, 50%. Uh, this is the um, pressure gradient. Uh, <clears throat> uh, post-operatively, you can see like, you know, 10 and five. Uh, in this situation, this is a, uh, my tricuspid valve uh, pressure gradient, 21, fairly preserved, normal pulmonary artery pressure. Came in, uh, in June 2005 uh, with the 22nd week of gestation, progressive shortness of breath and exertion, and, exert and uh, exercise intolerance to mild to moderate uh, activity over the last couple of weeks uh, prior to intoxication. No fever, chills, or sweating. And she was on some supplemental uh, uh, medicine, folic acid, and iron and stuff. And here the uh, TEE showing some thickening of the leaflet of uh, bioprosthesis and some limitation of one of the leaflet as we, uh, as we see here. This is uh, with color, as you can see, that there is a fair, uh, uh, there's a fair, uh, Pisa, as we can see, and there is at least uh, three uh, jets of mitral regurgitation. And again, you can see the marked limitation of uh, uh, this leaflet and this partial limitation of the leaflet. To better understand it, we did uh, a three uh, 3D uh, TEE echo. And as we can see that uh, it seems like, you know, at least partial uh, segments of two of the leaflets at this joint uh, area, it seems like markedly limited, with limited uh, act, uh, function and pliability. And then halfway, the, the other two are kind of, you know, still preserving movement. You can see here the struts of the bioprosthesis, the three struts. And again, this is a ventricular aspect uh, view of the uh, prosthesis. And again, we can see like in you know, half of the uh, two uh, uh, leaflets are not moving with the other two halves are moving. <clears throat> what happened? Okay. Okay. Very good. Again, uh, another rendition of the 3D. We measured the uh, <coughs> uh, wording valve area. I'm sorry. Uh, we measured the uh, uh, mitral valve area. Uh, A1. This is the around the ring about 2.9, and uh, A2 about 1.2. Uh, the pressure gradient, as we can see here. This 
is about 25 and the mean of 11. And they still preserve the fairly preserved LV systolic uh, function. And as we can see, there is um, a significant TR, and the pressure uh, greater now about uh, 48 millimeters of mercury. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what's the possible etiology? I would like to turn to our, uh, our speaker to tell us you know, what's, what's your opinion about this uh, presentation and uh, what could be done next in this regard. Well, um, there are several options here, but the one that comes first to my mind is uh, thrombosis. So you can have a thrombi of uh, uh, the leaflet. It's not even in biological valves uh, we can see it. Maybe you can comment also from a surgical uh, perspective. So <coughs> that will be my first hypothesis. It does not look like uh, endocarditis, and uh, the clinical history is not, not also consistent uh, with that, because that will be the other option to be some sort of... Uh, uh, vegetation, but it does not look like. Um, and considering it was relatively fast and within the setting of pregnancy, which can be procoagulant, that will be my first hypothesis with uh, th uh, thrombosis. I don't know, Henny, if you. Uh, how old is this uh, prosthetic valve? Uh, this is uh, uh, about uh, three years now. Three years after implantation. Well, I mean, still, it's early, but we have seen, depends on the type of uh, prosthetic valve. Uh, and there have been valves on the market that have been actually withdrawn because of early calcification and degeneration. This can still happen. You could have had, has he had, has she had any stenosis before that? Because sometimes during implantation, some of the leaflets get caught in sutures, while you, especially with the struts, and uh, they restrict the opening of the leaflets, and eventually they degenerate very quickly because of that. Uh, restriction of the suture being there. Clots cannot be ruled out because I have seen also clots forming on the ventricular aspect of the, uh, of the, the actual valve and it will uh, create some calcification. So you have some etiology. Would you operate on this lady? Uh, how many weeks is she? Pregnancy? 22nd weeks. 22nd weeks. And uh, what kind of symptoms she has? I'm sorry? Symptoms, symptoms. Yeah, symptoms, shortness of breath on exertion, uh, mild to moderate, and uh, exercise intolerance uh, over the like, you know, just about 10 to 14 days before she presented to uh, our center. The PA pressure? Uh, PA pressure, as we me measured in, the, in this uh, here, it was about uh, 45 plus uh, 8, 10. Oh. It's about like 55 to 60 millimeters of mercury. So quite, you know, uh, uh, difference from the uh, immediate post up. I would, I would wait on her at this point. I would probably do um, the 22nd week, but uh, you could do a try of uh, anticoagulation. And see, what was the INR? Of, uh, was she on warfarin already? Or? No, she was not. Uh, she was still she on. Was not, uh, uh, IR. She's actually been followed by uh, the hospital that she was in, like in, the surgery was done in other hospital in another city. But she presented to us, you know, like, you know, for these two times. And, uh, uh, but anyhow, you could consider it's not helping, and we don't have, unfortunately, much, uh, uh, as Dr. Nudge mentioned, uh, information about the previous uh, details of the previous surgery. Because always, like, mechanical uh, aspect of the uh, surgery it could be like, you know, playing. Uh, Role. But we saw a nice, actually, uh, uh, in almost like in a few months after uh, post-op uh, uh, surgery that was working quite perfectly well without uh, <clears throat> mitral regurgitation. Um, anyway, so we started her actually on uh, unfractionated uh, heparin, and we bridged her to um, warfarin uh, plus aspirin and also low dose of uh, diuretics. However, for so many social uh, logistic issue, she insisted that she be uh, referred back to her uh, hospital that she had, where she had actually her surgery at that time. And uh, we did the uh, proper uh, transfer for there. Uh, I got like in a phone call a few, uh, uh, like you know, uh, two months later, and our patient was, has been doing well on both uh, warfarin and aspirin plus low dose of uh, diuretics. 
Uh, question is, you know, do, is there any features of Panos uh, formation? I would like to ask Dr. Najm uh, and his experience from this kind of, you know, looking. Two years, two to two and a half years uh, post-operative, is it uh, early or is it possible, still possible? Uh, no. Valve, mitral valve replacements. Uh, typically and until now, the recommendation when you do mitral valve replacement is to preserve the posterior leaflet so you preserve the ventriculo annular continuity. That means that you're still connecting the papillary muscles to the annulus and that preserves the ventricular function and dimensions that has been proven scientifically. Now, if you do this for degenerative valve, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with, with that. If you do this for rheumatic valve, that means you're leaving behind a diseased leaflet, which is uh, a primary uh, uh, process that happens in rheumatic uh, valves. And what ends up happening, you end up with calcification because that disease is still there. So you leave that leaflet. And some surgeons went, because of also the evidence that sometimes you, they there are some papers saying that you could actually leave both, the anterior and the posterior. So we split the anterior, tack it up to the annulus, and replace both. The problem with this technique in aromatic disease is that you're leaving the leaflets, and these leaflets will calcify, even if they are dysfunctional and not used. They will calcify under the leaflet, under the valve, right. which is replaced. So you could have a progression of calcification what is the equivalent of panis. It's not real panis, but it's calcified leaflets under the, under the valve. And that's why now, if I am replacing a rheumatic mitral valve, the valve entirely has to come out, and I use artificial cordae to connect the papillary muscle to the annulus. So I preserve this, but simply by artificial cordae, not by leaving leaflets. And this is my personal experience also it, it, this, le these leaflets uh, are contributing to the late paravavra leak that we see in all those patients who get mitral valve and they, 20 years later, they come back with a paravavra leak and you wonder what the hell is happening? Why do you get paravavra leak 20 years later? And that is simply because these calcified leaflets, and you know the cal there's always a calcium turnaround, they get resorbed, absorbed, deposited, and so on. This calcium turnaround will create paravavra leak in this posterior leaflet, and that's why now I think I would take them out. It's a long answer to a short question, but this is my experience and my <laughs> Now we all benefit from yeah. this in-depth uh, review, quick review. Uh, I would like to also, uh, of course, uh, get the opportunity from your presence, Dr. Najib, about surgery, valve surgery in uh, pregnancy. What, what you, uh, you can tell us uh, from your uh, experience? Uh, and uh, when to intervene, and uh, what kind of, you know, uh, uh, outcome, you know, we, we get. We know it is associated with very high risk of uh, morbidity and mortality uh, in any kind of intervention on any valve, especially like, you know, the mitral valve. Actually, as a matter of fact, most of the times you can, uh, you can actually get the uh, patients to go through pregnancy without interfering with surgery, unless the most of the ones I've operated on were mechanical valves who got thrombosed because the lady decided that she's gonna have a baby and she stopped warfarin and then they come with a thrombosed uh, um, uh, valve and we obviously have to take them to surgery to, uh, to operate on them. Shortness of breath most of the time with good cardiology and obstetrics follow up, they are able to get them through pregnancy, uh, sometimes with an elective cesarean section and what I do is six weeks later after they have the, uh, the baby, we operate on the, on the valve to uh, whatever, uh, re replace, re repair, whatever we have to do with the valve. Uh, combined procedure, uh, cesarean and valve surgery is, is bad idea, I think. Uh, I don't think uh, there is an indication for this. And you should be able to get through the elective uh, cesarean section on time with the appropriate uh, 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 anesthesia and uh, quick, expeditious uh, extraction. I know did we you took repeat uh, the echo good time. In this, did you repeat the echo in this patient? No, she, she left and she hasn't come back to us. So you yet. don't have the answer for the final. Yeah, we don't have the okay. final. But as I told you, she, she's been doing, I talked to the, her doctor that she's doing fine and she's still on 
medical management. Yeah. Uh, I know that we took uh, a lot of time, you know, just about the, um, uh, there's hypercoagulable state of uh, pregnancy, you know, uh, that actually can predispose to uh, rapid deterioration of the, uh, especially bioprosthetic uh, valves, and uh, also potential of uh, thrombo uh, thrombotic and thromboembolic uh, uh, phenomena. And that actually depends on the type of the valve, whether it is uh, mitral and or uh, right-sided valve versus, of course, less uh, uh, embolic uh, aortic uh, valve. And also, again, uh, the location and the, and the type, whether it is mechanical or uh, uh, prosthetic. Uh, the clinical feature that actually can predispose more to development of uh, thromboembolic and thrombosis uh, of the valves, actually, uh, history of prior thromboembolic uh, event, associated atrofibrillation, uh, uh, valve in the mitral position, and of course, if there is multiple uh, prosthetic valve and uh, presence of LV dysfunction. As we can see, just we know, we know much about mechanical valve uh, thrombosis, but how about like bio, uh, prosthetic uh, valve thrombosis? As we can show, the general practice is that uh, patients with um, bioprosthetic, we do, we do not anticoagulate except like for the first three months uh, post-operatively. However, there is still uh, uh, some risk uh, from that. And now there is uh, aspirin now actually surfacing as a uh, recommendation uh, in bioprosthetic uh, valve. <clears throat> uh, this is, for example, uh, you know, uh, that uh, aspirin actually can be uh, uh, advocated in, uh, in, the, uh, in the first three months for bioprosthetic valve placement in patients who cannot on the importance of aspirin added to uh, warfarin in treating for uh, treating patients with uh, prosthetic uh, valve. <clears throat> Again, I just want to draw your attention to one study that was done back in 1993 where they actually uh, uh, randomized uh, <clears throat> patients, uh, uh, 370 patients randomized uh, to two groups, actually mechanical and uh, tissue valves, and they were treated with warfarin plus aspirin just across uh, the board. And <clears throat> they found that, you know, with aspirin added uh, to the, with aspirin added, as we can see, that there was 1.9% uh, uh, year mortality versus placebo, 8.9% year uh, mortality, with 77% risk reduction uh, for these patients. And if we add to it actually some other uh, parameters besides the major systemic embolization and non-fatal intracranial hemorrhage, and uh, death from hemorrhage, death from vascular disease, we can see even like this one, about 61% uh, risk reduction by adding aspirin to uh, warfarin. Uh, so although there is, of course, increased uh, risk of bleeding, but the benefit outweigh the, uh, the risk. So in summary, just number of patients of, of, of movement with uh, uh, prosthetic valve or heart disease is generally small to conduct like, you know, well discernible uh, uh, randomized and uh, long-term uh, trial. Uh, however, this is the, the, to emphasize the, uh, the, the uh, hypercoagulable status in, uh, in during a pregnancy that would require more attention and close monitoring of anticoagulation and of course uh, uh, addition of aspirin to, under, to um, warfarin as in general. Thank you very much and I'm sorry again to uh, take uh, your time.